My name's Ursula, and this is the channel where I interview people who have achieved financial independence. If you enjoy listening, then please do subscribe. So today I'm welcoming Neil onto my show. Hello, Neil. Hello, Ursula. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your story. Okay, yeah. Well, I suppose uh, as a lad, I was brought up in uh, Doncaster in Yorkshire. And uh, I think it was around about, when I was about 15 or 16, I decided that what I wanted to be when I grew up was an accountant, which, um, you know, where a lot of boys want to be train drivers and things, but I actually wanted to be an accountant. And so um, I, I, I was sort of quite into maths, shall we say, in a bit, a bit of a way. So it just seemed the natural progression for me to go into accountancy. So I um, went to uni and did an accountancy degree and then I qualified with a small firm of accountants in central London. And then I felt that, right, that's my path sorted. Um, this, this is what I'm going to be doing for the, you know, until I retire at 60 something. And then um, with some friends, we, um, they persuaded me to go traveling around the world. So around about in my mid twenties, I decided to give it all up. Um, and most importantly, give up the company car, which was uh, a tearful farewell to that, shall we say. And then uh, I went traveling for 18 months, got back when I was about probably age 28 with uh, 150 pounds to my name I thought that was a good piece of budgeting on my part and then uh, basically went from there to try and get a job um, so within the financial industry I first job I got was in the public sector and I basically stayed there ever since until a, a few years ago so that's sort of a bit about um, my, my my background um, in terms of my my career So it's really interesting that you say that you went into accountancy, because one thing I have noticed when I've spoken to people who've achieved financial independence, or I've been reading about people's stories, is there does seem to be quite a high prevalence of people who have sort of chosen to join the sort of financial services industry or kind of chosen to, to learn a trade. One thing I did note, though, is that you say that you sort of join the public sector rather than the private sector. Why was that? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't really a conscious decision. It was more that was the only job I could get when I got back traveling. So bearing in mind, I hadn't really, I didn't have any effectively job experience I could call on for the previous two years. And the market wasn't exactly buoyant at the time. So the idea was, um, I was just, you know, employed on a week by week basis and um, thinking that um, I'll do this for a couple of months and then move on and make my millions, you know, in the city somewhere. But that, that sort of never happened. And so I just sort of stayed there, still on a week-by-week basis. So I wasn't a full-time employed at all. And um, eventually got yeah, had to basically apply for my own job um, to become permanent. I sort of stayed in central government. I mean, I moved around, I changed roles here and there. So it was always very varied and very interesting and challenging, but I, and I largely enjoyed it quite a lot. So it's really by by accident I ended up really where I was um, for the time I was there. And um, so it wasn't a conscious move at all. It was just something I ended up doing, and um, I changed a bit here and there, but um, decided against, I guess, for whatever reason, against making a move out into the private sector. Yeah, I think quite a lot of people can probably late relate to what you're saying there in terms of not having a sort of a preordained life plan. When did you become interested in financial independence or at least sort of consider it to be possible for you to retire early? Well, I mean, I never really had such an interest really in doing that. I mean, um, arguably, I probably thought about it probably only about three or four years before I actually did it. It just sort of gravitated towards that. So I didn't really have a strategy you know, when I hit 30 and thinking, right, I've got a 20 year plan that never entered my, my mind. It was a case of just, just almost plodding along, do what I do and, and then sort of just see where it took me. I mean, um, I suppose I thought what I would do would be buy a place, uh, which I did do when I, when I was 32. And it happened to be a place I was renting at the time, actually. So and that was actually, um, quite a, quite a good result and I, I was quite lucky when I did buy a um, number of years ago because uh, the, the market was was quite low in terms of house prices um, and then I suppose I thought um, I would meet somebody get a family and and sort of almost 
do what everybody else, what the, you think is the norm for everybody else. But that the, the other part of that equation didn't really pan out like that. So it got to, you know, when I was suddenly, I suppose, mid-40s, and I suddenly thought, well, I'm, I'm not really going to have a family now. And I started sort of crunching some numbers, shall we say, and I started thinking then, really, that maybe, you know, I could do this for a few more years and then sort of really do something else. Or, I mean, my thinking was um, I'd get a full-time job and do maybe contract work for a few months here and a few months there and then have nine months off. And so that was really my my thinking. It was just something I really tended to, something I just fell into rather than actually, I didn't certainly didn't intend it and I certainly didn't plan it. And I certainly, you know, fire was definitely not a phrase I'd come across, you know, 20 odd years ago. So yeah, so it was just by accident really more than anything else, I would say. But it's certainly very impressive that you managed to achieve financial independence sort of by accident. But it's interesting, you're not the first person who I've spoken to who said that they achieved financial independence sort of before it became uh, the FIRE movement, so to speak. During these years, sort of were you investing at all, either in property or stocks and shares? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm quite, I suppose, a risk averse sort of person. So stocks and shares never really came into it. I did start thinking again when I hit, you know, mid forties, maybe another property would be the way to go. And if I could then generate an income through just I mean, one property, not, I'm not talking about a portfolio here. And then, cause my, my, the only thing that really sparked that interest, I suppose, was that I, I made sure that I paid off my mortgage as soon as I could. And that was probably the the driver behind it initially. I got um, basically a flexible mortgage, just paid off as much of the capital as I could, um, which saved an absolute bucket load of money in, in interest, basically. And that enabled me then to become mortgage-free um, when I was, I suppose, 40. And then I sort of started thinking then about, yes, getting another property, um, with the idea being that it would just provide just another source of income. Again, Again, it wasn't any more than a sort another source of in- income. Um, I had then thought, you know, maybe I'll retire. Um, I probably had it for a couple of years. Be suddenly I start thinking, well, oh, maybe I could use income from this and then, uh, you know, cut my hours at work. So it was just, you know, it was. So I suppose the, the paying off the mortgage was really the the, the catalyst to it all. And then it was just a more of a gradual thing since then. I mean, I saved up a lot for a big for a big deposit, um, as big a deposit as I could manage. And then, as I say, the key for me was getting this flexible mortgage, which basically worked that you pay your salary straight into paying off the mortgage. And then interest is added effectively after each month. Um, so there was no set time um, in which to pay because compound interest is, is just ridiculously expensive in terms of the amount of sheer cash you have to pay. And and so obviously I was very lucky that I, I bought when house prices were obviously nowhere near as expensive as they are now, um, although obviously salaries are, are higher, but uh, probably not to the same degree, I'm sure. But it was very much a goal of mine to, to pay that mortgage off as soon as I could. So yeah, so that's, that's what, that was probably my main um, consideration at the time. And um, I'm pleased I managed to, to do it probably a lot quicker than I thought I was going to. You're right. There's certainly a discrepancy in terms of house prices and what they are now in comparison to say 15, 20, 30 or 40 years ago. But I'm interested to sort of find out what you think is important in terms of the mindset and attitude that you need to have in order to achieve financial independence. I think that's a very good that's a very good point and I think mindset is a very key word on this because it's it's sort of a lot of people they just say think nothing about a two pound fifty cup of coffee, for example. And the issue isn't a two pound fifty, you know, cup of coffee. It's the fact that if you buy one of those or two of those every day for a, a year, you know, you know, if you're buying a two cups of coffee, that's a five pounds a day for two hundred days. That's a thousand pounds over forty years. That's forty thousand pounds in on, co- on coffee. And bearing in mind, of course, that's out of your net your net pay rather than your gross pay. So you have to earn sixty, seventy thousand pounds a year, and not a year, but over a lifetime to pay for two cups of coffee a day. I think it's appreciating that the, the value of, of every, every, almost of every penny. Now, I don't mean penny pinching. You know, I'm not saying never get a cup of coffee, but, you know, you don't need two cups of coffee a day if you want to retire early. If you come to two cups of coffee are very important, fair enough. It probably means you won't, you won't be able to retire early. Fortunately, I didn't like coffee. That was never an issue for me. And similarly, for example, I've never really needed the latest gadgets. I've never really 
feed into tech, don't have expensive contracts on mobile phones, that don't need the latest TV every year. So it really is that bit of a, a that mindset, as you correctly say, to 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 think that all these small amounts do add up to a huge amount wow. over over 30 years and you know I'm not saying as I say never a cup of coffee but maybe you have it once a week or you know a couple of times a month and it's more of a treat and make a cup at home and um, take it in a flask and things like that it, it really is that almost that that level of of I suppose detail or um, you need to consider if you if you sort of want to save money because ultimately it's retiring early is is your income less expenditure effectively if you um, it's a basic equation and if you spend less than you, the income you have gives you a more money to either invest in assets which will obviously bring benefits going forward or it, you know the extra extra income can pay off pay off loans on houses so um, it's, it's to, to me it's that mindset of not losing sight that everything no matter how small has a value takeaways you know do you really need to get two takeaways a week or, or whatever and um, so um, yeah so that's probably the bit the biggest thing in terms of the in terms of the mindset I think so I'm not saying I'm not saying don't do things but um, it's um, just maybe a little bit less I think you make some really interesting points there from my perspective a lot of this is just about being mindful and really considering the decisions that you make because I think it's really easy to forget that every decision you make has an impact it sort of sends it has a ripple effect and that could be long or or short term so one thing I do notice you know when I go into the office is sort of people buying tea and coffee and lunches every day and you know when you think about that on a sort of a weekly and then a monthly and then a yearly basis you know that can turn into an awful lot of money now that's and that's absolutely fine if that's genuinely really what those, you know, what people want to spend their money on. But I think it's just about taking a step back and thinking, what is it that I want to prioritise here? Am I prioritising the right thing? So, for example, I personally really enjoy travelling. So, you know, that is something that I do spend my money on. But I'm not particularly bothered about stuff. I'm not fussed about the latest gadgets going clothes shopping all the time so you know that's kind of where my sort of priorities are but I think also we have got stuck into a bit of a culture of instant gratification and it's sort of very much you know I want it and I I, I want it now which is you know which is not to say you don't want to become a penny pincher and someone who never spends any money because we all know you know we all know who those people are and they don't tend to be that much fun so I think it's just sort of really about being mindful and, and trying to strike a balance which leads me really nicely onto my next question actually so for a lot of people achieving financial independence can just seem like really hard work a real tough mountain to climb with a lot of emphasis on on compromise and, and deferring gratification so I suppose I'd be interested to know from you are there any downsides to achieving financial independence and in particular you know the, the journey to financial independence yeah, I mean, I suppose in terms of downsides to financial independence, the I think the key is to um, always be one step ahead and be. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I've fallen into this trap yet, but you need to have a bit of a plan. And so, when I realised I felt I could achieve financial independence, um, my main concern was when I achieved it, it was basically in September, and I thought I've got to get through the winter. How am I going to get through a winter when you know it's cold, dark, grey? Won't fancy going out so much. But I, but I had so I sort of thought about this and um, and realised. Well, I'll just do some projects around the house. I'll I I almost like um, I had an old I don't know, I still have one like an old style calendar when I write down things so I go you know when we when we could go out <laughs> you know say well I'm busy Wednesday Thursday but not doing anything on uh, Monday Tuesday next week but then now on Wednesday and Thursday and then I've got a few days off so um, the key was to, to go right well I'm not necessarily busy and have anything to do every day but um, which is fine I've got a block of four days there I will paint a room in the in the house that's needed doing for a few years and um, and so have a bit of a plan B be ahead of the game, you know, because you will have time on your hand. And this this is the the downside is that 
if you're used to working really hard five days a week, um, you come home, you know, you have your, have your dinner, you, you watch a bit of telly, go to bed and repeat ad infinitum, it might seem. Suddenly you've got time on your hands and that might sound idyllic straight away because you, you, but it's different than being on a holiday. It's not like you've got a week off where you can just chill out and relax. You know, technically you could be chilling out for 30, 40 years. And so, um, you do need to, and I don't think I've fallen into this trap, but you do need to have a bit of an idea of what you can do with the time. I, I felt I've been able to fill mine quite easily out of interest. Um, and at the moment, I often feel, how did I ever have a full-time job? That is the potentially d- the downside, is, is you think, what am I going to do? You know, you don't want to end up watching daytime TV all, all the time and um, and just, you know, feeling I just go, just go down the pub all the time and things. So so you don't want to go get into that, fall into that trap. So I'd say that is really the potential downside. Yeah, it's funny you should say that, actually, because you're not the first person who either retired or achieved financial independence who said that they wonder how they ever fitted in a a full-time job when they were working. And I think you also make a really good point in in terms of it being important that people actually think about what do they actually want to do when they retire or achieve financial independence because it can be quite a a contrast going from in some cases you know working full-time potentially working all hours that God sends to suddenly having all the time in the world on your hands and I'd be interested to know you know with you did you sort of go straight from sort of working full-time to your current status or was it a bit more of a gradual process? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 again, the, the catalyst, I would say, was um, there was a redundancy scheme through work and I took advantage of it. I applied for one two years before, but it was rejected, um, much to my disappointment. But uh, arguably, it was probably a couple of years too early. But And then they did another scheme and I and they didn't really have a leg to stand on, should we say. So that was sort of the, the catalyst. And I got obviously a chunk of money, not, uh, not, a, we're not talking millions here, but you know, but, but it wasn't a nice little sum. So that was set the ball rolling, should we say. And then, so I had really five, six months really to plan what my next steps would be. And, um, and I thought I would, um, you know, go through this, you know, work, say a few days a month, temporary contracts, probably, probably uh, going through to organizations who had year ends. And then I'd be like an extra pair of hands doing finance because I wanted to still do something technical. And um, to, to say I do enjoy, do enjoy the job, and so I wanted to keep doing that. I didn't want to just let my brain get a mush. But uh, and then I, I was fortunate to get a role after about six months um, through a friend actually who um, applied for a job for a charity, which works very well for me. So I work basically three days a month doing that. No, three days a month can be at any time. They could I could do them on the Saturday. And if I want to, or I can do them in the evening or wait till it's raining and then do it that day. Um, and that sort of, that keeps me going. But it's interesting that, you know, some of our trustees, you know, a couple of the people are really, really high powered um, executives, should we say. One's an ex chairman of British Rail, for example. And so, so obviously an individual like that. Bill is he clearly wanted to um he was the thought obviously I've been doing this incredibly high power job and I can't just go from that to nothing. And so he probably also thought, well, you know, maybe I'll be able to do something else. I'll I'll be a trustee. I can I've still got a lot to give. Um I want to keep active in in business in some way, shape or form. So that's what he did. And effectively I've effectively done the same, but to a to a lesser degree, to to just keep myself ticking over really. But yeah, so it was just it, it wasn't again planned, but I mean it was just a, a great I was I was lucky. Um I'm not I'm not beating around the bush. I was lucky. You know, I still have deadlines and I still have uh, things I've got to do uh, you know like a, a routinely uh, routine things. I want to do a good job. Um, I'm not just going to sit down and go, and no, I can't be bothered doing it today. Although it's a really nice day, I might, I might go, I'll do it tomorrow. But yeah, so it, it's quite a nice deal, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's just nice to do. It, it's, it's sort of, you know, I get a small fee. Um, so I don't need, really need that money to ensure my, uh, my financial independence. It's, you know, you know, I'm not going to kiss goodbye to a, a couple of hundred pounds because it's not much more than that. But, um, it's just nice to do. I just, I just do it because I, I want to do it and I, and I enjoy the work. Yeah, I can certainly see how work can sort of provide you with structure and and some enjoyment. So what projects are you currently working on and how do you fill all your time? 
Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know, there's obviously voluntary work. Uh, there's like, I've been toying with the idea of being a film extra, for example. Um, you've got a, I've got our projects to do around the house, as I've mentioned. But the one thing I'm, I really want to start looking into more is doing private maths tuition. Uh, one-to-one for kids who are about to do their GCSEs. So that's something that I want to... Because I think I, I I did a little bit of training here and there, I suppose, when I in my previous job, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it when I felt that somebody got some benefit out of it. And so I I, I want to do sort of continue that. So I'm really looking into doing that. I've got a few books and example books, which I um, sort of um, looking at some YouTube videos about, you know, how to go back to, you know, trigonometry and, you know, what's the tangent and sine and cosine and things. I'm enjoying doing that. And that's something that I want to uh, start doing some as well. Again, because that will keep myself interested in in doing things it'd be it'd be doing a, a subject i enjoy and again hopefully somebody else can benefit from it um other hobbies i enjoy i enjoy dancing it's, it's called syrup dancing which is great fun and uh I've got a bunch of friends through that as well as being very sociable you know and i, I don't want to you know think that i've been sat as a hermit all these years not doing much because i have you know done quite a lot i've gone to quite a few countries um in my time and um so i still enjoy traveling i'm probably not as much of a traveler as i used to be um, i think i've been to most places I want to go to. But obviously when I went, I didn't go five star. I uh, sort of um, quite enjoy going um, near a two or three star because I think you've sort of seen more of a place and you get a better idea of the country and the people. So yeah, just maybe some, just more of that really. And then see how it, how it pans out. You know, it asked me a year ago if I'd want to do mass tuition, I'd have gone probably not. But now it's an, um, I'm thinking, yeah, I could probably um, get some out of that. So it's just, again, being a bit, you know, thinking six months ahead or maybe two or three years ahead and um, just to keep yourself busy and uh, whatever whatever it happens to be, whatever floats your boat. And there's no right or wrong answer in what you will enjoy doing. You know, you might enjoy painting and do more of that. Um, I, I play the guitar a bit. Um, not particularly high standard, but um, I might enjoy it. So it's just bits of things, you know, you, um, if you like gardening, I don't, but I know friends who've got an allotment and um, you know that's what they do again that's not for me there's lots of things out there that you can do to um, to spend your time and um, enjoy what you do and you know there's no point in getting this financial independence if you're not going to enjoy it so yeah so you've got to just go make the most of it and, um, and that's what I'm trying to do I'm not saying I always succeed but that's what I'm trying to do I think you're right you've definitely got to be creative and proactive and I always think it sort of portrays a, a lack of imagination when people sort of say that they wonder what they would do with their time if they didn't have to work. And I always sort of feel like saying, well, it is your life. What you do with your life should should be something of your choosing. So my final question to you, is there anything that surprised you about achieving financial independence? Having achieved it, um, I suppose, I suppose now I'm surprised at how, I suppose, relatively easy it is that I've, um, encompassed it as part of my daily life. You know, I probably thought it was going to be a bit harder than it had been, but I think having put in, you know, ideas and thoughts about what to do with my time, um, that I think that definitely helps. Um, you're not going to get it right all the time of course and the, but there's arguably been a handful of days when I've gone oh I was bored that day um, all I did was sat on my arse and, and watch the telly you know click yourself out of it and you go right tomorrow I'm going to do this that and the other so you know you might have days like that but you might have days like that anyway and you know you get to a Sunday and you're going right well I didn't really do much today so but it, but to me it's been um, the, the transition has been better than I thought so that arguably surprised me because uh, I thought I would struggle with like winters you know I'm sat here in my shorts and things like that and I haven't enjoyed a bit of sunshine today but the winters I, I, I don't find so bad because because you see the daylight you know if you're stuck in an office all the time you, you arrive in the dark and you leave in the dark you don't really see much of the daylight but the winters I find a lot better than I thought because you actually get to see the daylight in the on the six hours when it is light so so in that sense it, it's probably be, it was easier than I thought it was but um, I really think that Having, you know, getting this part-time job was, was brilliant and I did, and I've been quite fortunate that I have had little odd jobs around the house I've been able to do, but I know they will run out 
and soon, and which is why I'm think, planning ahead to to do this this other thing like the maths tutoring. So in a sense, it has surprised me, but uh, that that the transition was easier than than I thought. Uh, than arguably I thought it was going to be. So I feel confident now that you know that I, I I'll I'll never go back. There's there's no sense need for me to go back to a to a full time job. And so yeah, so it, so in a sense because it's three about three two and a half three years ago that I I sort of made the switch, shall we say? And um, I, I felt that I've 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 coped. I've said better than I thought. So that was probably surprised me. Interesting that you say that you don't think you'll ever have to go back to full-time work because a previous guest on my show said that he was very aware that he may potentially have to go back to work and that sort of financial independence may not be permanent, which I thought was a really different and interesting perspective. I've got a friend of mine and she um, started going part time around about her early 40s. And then she, um, hopefully she, she wanted to be, but she became pregnant. Um, obviously a little bit later than um, most people would. Very happy. She's very happy about it. But now she's full time working again because in order to get the income. And so that is obviously one of the, um, that would be a, a big, big, so, so it depends on your, what happens to your life, you know, and things can come left from left field when you're not expecting them. And, um, so, you know, if you've got big financial commitments, like, um, a young child, um, which you might have, it's only in her case, in her mid, mid to late forties, then, then that will definitely change what you'll be able to achieve, I think. Cause, you know, whether you want them or not, children are very expensive. Or, you know, it could be in later life. Maybe you've had a family and you've been able to achieve that, but then suddenly you've got grandchildren or, you know, you want to help your kids onto the housing market and, um, and th- things like that. So it really just depends on your, on your circumstances. So, and there's, so, so there's definitely not one size fits all, but based on what I expect to happen, um, at the moment in my, I suppose, life going forward, that's what I envisage. But yeah, you've got to be, I suppose, prepared for, th- for things and, you know, things may well come from left field that you're not expecting. They may still come from left field for me. I have to be prepared for that. That situation should it happen, you know, based on my my life at the moment, um, I, I I can't envisage it, but it doesn't mean it won't. And therefore, obviously, should that happen, then I will have to then reassess and and make changes as necessary. So so yeah, so who who knows what's around the corner? Yes, exactly. Who does know what's going to happen in the future? But I think you're right. It's really about being flexible and planning as much as possible for the future anyway that's all we've got time for so thank you to neil for a really interesting discussion and thank you for listening tune in for my next show thank you for listening if you've enjoyed this interview then please do subscribe to my channel